Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. And we have some breaking news to share today. Our recent trend in archaeological work is to use satellite imagery to find archaeological sites and ruins. Well, we've been poring over recent satellite imagery of Armenia for months, and we are excited to announce we have discovered the location of Noah's Ark. I know, right? It's incredible. We could hardly believe it ourselves, but here it is. Let's zoom in a bit. Enhance. 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 April Fools. How many of you did we fool with that one? Well, now that we've had our little bit of fun, we want to take some time today, in the spirit of April Fool's Day, to explore some archaeological hoaxes and fakes. Let's dig in. Dealing with fakes, forgeries, and hoaxes is unfortunately just part of modern archaeology. Now sometimes artifacts are faked for good reasons, like when a museum wants to have a replica artifact on display, maybe while the actual artifact and goes restoration or something like that, or maybe a souvenir shop wants to sell a replica of an artifact so that you can take something home without having to actually loot an archaeological site. So that's a good thing, and it's pretty common to find these kinds of replicas, and you may even have some yourself. But there are also cases of full-on forgeries, artifacts that are made with the intent to mislead. There may be financial motives involved, or collectors and museums will pay big bucks for certain artifacts that have historical significance. Other times, artifacts are forged to prove a point or pursue a particular agenda. Sometimes these forgeries are totally fake. A skilled artisan makes something from scratch and then, using various mechanisms, ages it to make it appear older than it actually is. Other times, actual artifacts are used and then altered to make them more valuable or interesting. For example, if a pretty plain and boring lamp is purchased by an antiquities dealer, they may etch in a cross or an inscription to make it seem like a more rare or significant artifact. Collectors will pay a lot more for that than they will for a boring old lamp, and unless you know what to look for, you might be fooled. There are some high-profile cases of forgeries, like the Kensington runestone and the Etruscan terracotta warriors, where their status as forgeries is pretty certain. Other cases, like the Shard of Turin, are generally thought to be forgeries, but there are still quite a few believers in its authenticity. But today, we want to talk about a few artifacts that are more closely related to the archaeology of the land of the Bible, some you've likely heard of and some you may not be familiar with. In 2013, the Geological Survey of Israel announced that it had authenticated a royal inscription of a king of Judah, Jehoash. The artifact was a stone tablet, maybe about the size of a laptop, and it had a Paleo-Hebrew inscription. To not come from a controlled excavation, but from an antiquities dealer. Take note of this, it will be a trend. The geological analysis of the stone in the inscription suggests that it was, in fact, ancient. The geologists believe that this was an actual inscription from King Jehoash of Judah. The inscription itself, about 15 lines, would have essentially been con confirmation of what is recorded in 2 Kings 12, how Jehoash refurbished the Temple of Solomon. The inscription tells that story in greater detail. But more than that, this would be archaeological and textual proof of an Israelite temple from the Iron Age on what is now the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Do not underestimate how huge that would be. But while the geologists were all in, archaeologists, epigraphers, and philologists had immediate reservations. Now, that's not because they wouldn't love it for it to be real. An inscription of this length and significance would be huge for the field. But something about the discovery felt off. It was too good to be true. And it was. It's not because the tablet was too complete and legible, something really rare in archaeology. There are other problems with it as well, things the hard sciences don't pick up on in their testing. For example, some of the vocabulary doesn't fit late 9th or early 8th century Paleo-Hebrew when it would have been written. Instead, it fits the Hebrew of later centuries. Imagine reading Shakespeare and then there's a line from Charles Dickens. The language is similar, it just doesn't fit. It's a different style. The epigrapher Christopher Ralston noted that in other West Semitic writings that are contemporary or near contemporary with when the Jehoash inscription was purportedly written, the letters Kaf and Samek are always offset. The Kaf appears higher than the Samek, but that's not the case on the Jehoash inscription. Here, they are not offset. Here's what it would look like if they were. That's something that only an epigrapher or an ancient scribe would notice. Also, when you break down the inscription, about 75% of it is just cut and pasted phrases from the Bible. It's more of a linguistic mosaic than an actual, original royal inscription. There are a number of other problems that have been found with the Jehosh inscription, and too many to go over it all here. But suffice it to say, experts in this period in the, he in the Hebrew language do not believe it to be authentic. Instead, it's a very clever modern forgery. 
this is a pretty high profile case of what is generally regarded as a forgery. In 2002, at a press conference in Washington, D.C., the editor of the magazine Biblical Archaeology Review announced the discovery of an ossuary with a very unique inscription. It would be on display in a museum in Toronto at the same time as the annual meetings of the scholarly societies which study the Bible and Near Eastern archaeology. Now, just a quick note. An ossuary is a stone box that was used for what's called secondary burial in Palestine in the first century AD. Now, during that time, when someone died, the body would first be treated with spices to cover the smell, wrapped in cloth, and laid out in a family tomb, a sealed cave, or something similar. This is what we see happening with the body of Jesus after his crucifixion. It would be left there for months or years until the flesh had rotted away, and then the bones would be collected into one of these stone boxes. This would allow the person's remains to be stored in a smaller space, and the larger space where the body was laid out could be reused. Now, these ossuaries are quite common and quite popular with collectors, and the James ossuary was in the collection of a well-known collector who has one of the world's largest private collections of artifacts related to the biblical world. Now, what made this ossuary remarkable is that it had an inscription on it that said, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. The contention was that this stone box once belonged to, or held the bones of, James the Just, the brother of Jesus and author of the Epistle of James, a leader of the early church in Jerusalem. It would have been an earth-shattering discovery to have material evidence of someone so closely connected to Jesus. And naturally, claims of this magnitude meant close examination was warranted. The actual ossuary is generally thought to be authentic. Now, this is not really where there is much dispute. The ossuary has a patina, or residue, on it that is consistent with it being very old and being stored in a cave. The point of contention is around the authenticity of the inscription. And it's the inscription that gives this box so much value. Not just monetary value, but historical and cultural value. Some noted epigraphers looked at the writing and concluded it is the right kind of cursive Aramaic for the first century. The patina in the inscription has caused some debate. The Israel Antiquities Authority believes the patina in the inscription proves it is a modern forgery, while other experts believe the patina, or lack thereof, in the inscription is the result of modern cleaning. The collector who owned the ossuary was ultimately indicted in Israel on 44 counts related to forgery, trafficking of antiquities, and fraud, although he was only convicted on the illegal trafficking of antiquities charges. Still not a great look. There are many who claim the James ossuary is authentic, and there are a lot of good scholars who support that contention. But in general, most archaeologists do not believe the inscription is authentic and is in fact a modern addition to a first century artifact. The Dead Sea Scrolls are one of, if not the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. Now, I won't rehash the whole story, just a few relevant details. You've probably heard the well-known tale of the Bedouin boy throwing rocks into caves above the Dead Sea near the site of Qumran. He heard pottery smash, and this led him to explore the cave where he discovered the scrolls. Now, while this the truth of that story is debated, we do know when the first Dead Sea Scrolls fragments came into modern possession. Initially, two Bedouin men sold four scrolls to a Bethlehem-based antiquities dealer named Khalil Iskander Shaheen, better known as Kondo. This set off excavations by the famed archaeologist Roland DeVoe at Qumran, and the collection, preservation, translation, and publication of the corpus of scrolls collected from the site. Decades later, in 2001, the publication of the scrolls was completed. It seemed that the archaeological chapter on the Dead Sea Scrolls was closing. Then, rumors began to circulate that some fragments of scrolls remained, hidden away. In 2002, William Kondo, the son of the original Bethlehem antiquities dealer, whose family has always been closely tied with the scrolls, approached scholars about selling a few fragments he had locked away in a vault in Switzerland. Since 2002, 75 scroll fragments have been sold, and for a staggering sum of money. Like, really, truly staggering. At first, a couple were sold to private collectors. Then a few more. Then more and the excitement around the possibility of new scrolls seemed to outweigh the professional skepticism that they were owed. 
As more scrolls were sold for obscene dollar figures and no one seriously questioned their authenticity, more and more were sold. But at some point this changed. The market dried up. Some did question the authenticity of these new fragments. Were the scrolls and the writing on the fragments authentic and unprovenanced, or were they forgeries? And which option is worse? As a disclaimer, I'll say I have seen the real McCoy, the authentic fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls on display in Israel. I've been to the Shrine of the Book and the Israel Museum, and it's incredible. It's an amazing exhibit, and regardless of your faith, it's a very moving display. But I've also actually held several of the post-2002 scrolls. Now, I'm not an expert in anything related to the scrolls, but I can tell you the post-2002 fragments really do look like the real thing. It's very easy to see it and believe it, especially when you want them to be real. The material looks the same, the writing looks the same, they're very believable as authentic fragments. But they aren't the same. Testing has been done on many of these fragments, and as far as I know, everyone that has been tested has been shown to be a modern forgery. The most famous story came from the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., which had several copies. Five of their 16 were tested, and all of the tested fragments were proven to be forgeries. Scholars now believe most, if not all, of the post-2002 scrolls are modern forgeries. And when you step back a bit and look at the scrolls, it makes sense. Now, of the scrolls found in excavation, only about 25% were of biblical passages. The rest are deuterocanonical texts or texts specific to the Qumran community. By contrast, over 75% of the post-2002 texts are biblical, a proportion that is way out of line compared to the authentic collection. Now, the biblical texts sell for more money, obviously. If you're going to buy a piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls, texts which have had an enormous impact on the study of the Bible, you probably want a biblical passage. And if you're going to take the time and the effort to make such convincing forgeries, you want to maximize the money that you get for them. And that means forging biblical passages. Now, as it stands, not all of the post-2002 texts have been proven to be definitively forgeries. But the assumption in the field is that they all are. I think there are some important takeaways from these cautionary tales. First off, don't be a sucker. If something is too good to be true, it probably is. If something confirms all your priors just as you'd want it to, you should be skeptical. Remember that Jesus told his followers to be shrewd as vipers. But Jesus also told them to be as innocent as doves. And while I'm sure this is not what he was originally intending, I think there's a case to be made that this innocence may extend to the antiquities trade. You probably shouldn't be involved. There are ethical problems involved with almost all antiquities. Not that they're all unethical, but, well, that belongs in a museum! Forgeries are rife in the antiquities trade. Their ethical concerns, particularly the artifacts, come from conflict regions, and it's usually best to admire the works of antiquity in a venue where we can all enjoy them together. A common trend you see in these hoaxes and forgeries is the issue of provenance. No one is ever quite sure where the artifact came from, or somewhere in the chain of custody it gets a bit murky. This happens even in archaeological excavations. Just last week, it was announced that a tablet was found at the site of Ebal. In the press release, it's claimed that this inscription is about 38 letters and would be older than any other known Hebrew inscription. They claim the proto-alphabetic script mentions Yahweh in a chiastic structure. Now, some good epigraphers have already looked at this, which is encouraging, and it would be amazing to have this inscription be included in the corpus of early Hebrew inscriptions. And this will undoubtedly get more scrutiny from the community of scholars, so stay tuned as this develops, as we're going to keep an eye on it. But also know that this was found from sifting through material from a prior excavation. It was not found in situ, it was basically found in a dump, this has not been peer-reviewed, the original excavators did not find it. So what we have, if authentic, is out of its original context. And this underscores the importance of controlled archaeological investigations. In actual investigations, artifacts are removed in a controlled manner. They are documented, very well documented. And importantly, the whole process is sanctioned by the local governance. There are areas and ways the process of excavation to public awareness could be streamlined and improved, but currently, controlled, sanctioned excavations are our best tool. They help us avoid sensationalizing finds and getting caught up in excitement around the possibility of an earth-shattering find, only to be disappointed when it turns out not to be true. And this brings me to my final point. Archaeology can be disappointing. And I'll say now, Noah's Ark will never, ever be found. I'm sorry, but it won't. 
Real, trained, legitimate archaeologists do not go on quests to find the Ark. Even if you hold a literal reading of Genesis 6 through 9, you shouldn't expect the Ark to still be around. A wooden structure will decay quite rapidly when exposed to the elements for too long. The fence in my own yard needs posts replaced every few years, and these have modern chemical treatments for outdoor exposure. And if you believe there was a historical Ark, just don't expect to find it millennia later. Finding relics or artifacts related to specific people or events isn't what archaeology is about. Usually the finds in an excavation aren't sensational, and archaeologists aren't digging in search of the sensational, at least not anymore. Once upon a time, archaeology was basically just a euphemism for looting and hunting for museum quality pieces, but it's changed, and for the better. Archaeology helps us understand our past with the accumulation of often mundane but nevertheless important remains. Now, our understanding of the past is not built on sensational idiosyncratic finds, but on a mountain of data accumulated over years and years of excavations. It doesn't grab as many headlines, but it works as a better foundation for understanding the ancient world, including the world of the Bible. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to give this video a like and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. You can also follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging. Oh, 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 o